Amen. It is good to be saved. It's good to be in church. First Peter chapter 1. Uh, we're going to look at a few verses here. First starting at verse 1. First Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again in, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he'll be my focus for today's message. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Let's pray. Father, again, it is good to be saved and it's good to be in church. And Lord, we ask you to bless the message as always, Lord. And we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, last week I asked a question. I said, uh, you know, when you want to, you have a conversation with someone, you say, you want to hear the bad news first or the good news first? And most people said they want to hear the bad news first, and I agreed with that. And that's why we preached on the subject of hell last week. Uh, hell is bad news. Uh, a lot in, in the Bible is bad. It's negative. All right? Um, it's, it's a sad thing. But we gave you the bad news first. Now this week we're going to look at the good news, and that, that's the good news of heaven. All right, God's a simple God. He gives people a choice, and there's uh, two destinations of one soul. And that'll either be hell, which we looked at last week, or heaven, which we're going to look at today. Now, last week the title of the message was, Hell is Motivation. And the title of this week's message is, Heaven is Definitely, <laughs> definitely motivation as well. Right, now the word motivation means uh, the reason or reasons one has for acting or behaving in a particular way. The general desire of willingness of someone to do something. Synonyms for motivation means incitement, spur, enthusiasm, drive, ambition, determination, and inspiration. All right, one of the motivations uh, about hell that we looked at is that, hey, uh, hell is an option. And that if we went someone to, to the Lord, then that soul is not going to go to hell. We have a lot of friends. We have a lot of family. We've got a lot of co-workers. We've got people that we love. We don't want them to go to hell. We want them to go to heaven. We don't want them going down. We want them going up. And if you're a born-again Christian, then you've got to be motivated to tell a lost and dying world about hell. All right? Now, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 is appointed unto man wants to die, then after this, the judgment. You see, we're all going to be judged. We all live, we all die, we're all going to be judged by God, and it's our soul is where it's going to spend an eternity. Our soul is either going to be in heaven forever, or it's going to be in hell forever. All right? And God judges us and sends our soul in one of two places. It's either going to hell or it's going to heaven. All right, now the Bible does have a lot to say about heaven. And if you remember last week on the subject of hell, 70% of what was written about the subject of hell was actually spoken personally and taught by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the authority on hell. The Bible has a lot to say about hell. The Bible has a lot to say about heaven. Now, did you know that there are how many heavens? Three, three. You got it. You got it. There's three. All right. There are three heavens. All right. The first heaven is called uh, is called the firmament heaven. All right. In Genesis chapter one verse eight, God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Where is that heaven? When you see a bird flying in the air, or an airplane, or you throw a rock up in the up in the air, that's the first heaven. All right. The second heaven is located where? The moon, the planets, the stars, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 9, 
uh, four, uh, 4, verse 19, And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations, unto the whole heaven. All right, the third heaven is which my wife was referring to, is the one great heaven, and that is God's throne. All right, according to the apostle Paul, he actually got caught up in the third heaven. All right, he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, he says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such as one caught it up to the third heaven. All right, so Paul calls God's throne the third heaven. So you got the third heaven is where God is, the second uh, heaven is where the moon and the stars and, and the galaxies are, and the first heaven is where the birds and the, and, and the airplanes fly. All right? Now, last week we looked at where's hell. Hell is located in the center of the earth. All right, that's what Jesus Christ said. And you say, where is heaven located? Well, the Bible answers that. All right? Heaven is north. <laughs> okay? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. All right, so if you like look up in the sky, you have the north star, and then, you know, you, you got the southern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, heaven is located north. All right, who created heaven? Not a trick question. We all know this one. What's the first verse in the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right? Just a few things on heaven. Heaven is where God lives. All right? In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus shows us how to pray and tells us where God lives. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 9, Our Father, which art in heaven. Okay? Hallowed be thy name. Heaven is where God's throne is. Isaiah 66, verse 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, that heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. So there's God up in the north, and he's up in heaven, and he puts his little foot, or his big foot, on little old earth. He treats earth like a footstool. All right? God rules and reigns in heaven. Psalms 11, verse 4 says, The Lord is his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. God is so big that he fills all of heaven. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24 says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth? God is everywhere. We call that the doctrine of omnipresence. God is everywhere. All right? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is in heaven right now, sitting on the right hand next to the Father. All right, Mark chapter 16, verse 19 says, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. All right, so Jesus Christ is sitting next to the Father in heaven right now. All right, and let's not forget the Holy Spirit. All right, he's God too, and he's in heaven too. First John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one all right heaven is where god lives heaven is the eternal home of god's people god lives there and god wants his people to live there with him all right and the minute you become a born again christian you become one of god's children and your final destination after you die is heaven all right, your home is heaven. All right, you're heaven bound. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 22, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We got a book. It's called the book of life. It's in heaven. And the minute you get saved, God tells one of his angels, he says, Gabriel, I want you to write old brother Joe's name in there. You get logged in. You're in the book of heaven. And you're going to heaven because heaven is your home. Amen. Now we get to live with God. Now we're still living here in an old cursed world. But our future home is heaven. Our names are written in heaven. We've got an eternal reservation. All right? Remember the old days of trying to make a reservation for a hotel? You had to, you had to call up on the telephone, and you looked at the answer, and they said, well, let me see the hotel's book. You can't get a room. 
Or, you know, one of the first vacations I ever took with my wife and kids, we drove down to Orlando, Florida, 22 hours straight, no sleep, 5,000 hotels. I couldn't get a room. We had to stay in Kissimmee at a Motel 6 with a wife and, a, and two babies. I was tired. I said, this is crazy. My wife said, you should have reserved a room. That's why she's got the brains and the family. All right. But the minute you become saved, the minute you become a born again Christian, God has locked you into his book. He's reserved a room for you in heaven. Our opening verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, to an inheritance incorruptible. Heaven is pure, undefiled, there's no sin. That fadeth not away. Heaven's there forever, reserved in heaven for you. We all got a reservation. We're going to heaven. Not like you go to heaven. Well, we, we done lost your reservation. Gordon, who are you? No, sorry, but we don't got you. No! We got your name written in the book of heaven. And if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, there's two ways that you're going to end up in heaven. Say, really? Two ways? Well, Pastor, you're, you're throwing a lot of curveballs with the three heavens and the, now the two ways. The first way is if you die. All right, if you die. Paul says rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. The minute a New Testament Christian dies, it's like, Ooh, I'm in heaven. Okay? All right. The second way is how? There's a thing called the Rapture, right. You see, the Lord can come at any second. All right? He can come at any second. We could be at, we could be at the middle. I could just about, just about take Jonathan and Jared and Jaira or Carolina and go for the baptism. Just about. And the Lord comes and poof. We're in heaven. He can come at any second. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which heard was there, as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. We're all going to be down here on earth, and then one day we're going to hear that trumpet. What's that? Boom. Come up hither. We're in heaven. All right, so there's two ways we get there. Either we die, or we get raptured. Uh, I'll, I'll go personally for number two. <laughs> Come, even so come, Lord Jesus, all right? Now, we say, Pastor Hank, what are we going to do when we're in heaven? We see those little cartoons like we're floating on a cloud with the halo playing the harp. I mean, it could. I mean, it could happen, but I, I don't think so. I'm going to give you like a little review of what's going to happen in heaven. The first thing in, that's going to happen is in heaven is that we're going to be judged by God. And that's called the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done. Right, the judgment seat of Christ is also mentioned in Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5. This is a special judgment which does not determine whether or not we go to heaven. That is eternally secure and reserved for us. But the judgment seat of Christ is a special judgment that God... Uh, puts on his believers, on his Christians, where we will be rewarded for the things that we've done. All right? All right, so one day all of us will, will be standing before the Lord in heaven, and we're going to have to give an account. Now, for some, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a you know, great day, and for some, it'll be like that, a so-so day. And for some Christians that just got in by the skin of their teeth, it's not going to be a fun day. It's going to be a little bit like a courtroom, and guess who the defendant is? We, we the defendant, all right? God's going to ask you, the high judge Jesus, he's going to ask you some questions. He's going to ask, what did you do in your life? How did you manage your life? How did you live for him? What was your motivation? Was your motivation Jesus Christ, or was it just chasing after money? All right? We're all going to have to give an account on what we did. Right? He's going to talk about the sins in our lives. He's going to talk about how our heart was towards others. And we're going to have to give a full account. All right? Again, it's, it's important to emphasize that this is a, a general judgment towards us, which does not determine our salvation because we are already saved. All right? In general terms, what are some things that we will be judged with? We will be judged with, did we obey the Great Commission? Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things. Uh, the question is, did you go or did you stay? Did you witness or did you not witness? Did you teach? Did you not teach? Did you tell? Or did you not tell? All right, another question is, uh, were you victorious over sin? Did sin win over you or did, or did you defeat sin? All right. James chapter 3 uh, describes uh, the tongue and the evilness that it does. Were you able to control your tongue towards others? All right. Another thing we'll be uh, judged on is our doctrinal beliefs and the degree of intellectual honesty. All right. Uh, the things that, that I taught, that other Bible teaches, that you study, do you believe in them or not? All right. That's important. Um, the secrets that we hold, that we keep inside, that we might not share with anyone, those will be judged. Romans 2.16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. We're going to be judged by the things that maybe other people don't know about us, but the things that we keep within ourselves. You know, we all have like little secrets. We got little, what do you call skeletons in the closet. You know, some of our Christian friends might not know about them, but God knows about them. God's going to judge us on our conduct and attitudes towards other people. Were you a crabby Christian or were you a, a, a graceful Christian? All right. As a Christian, your behavior traits that affected others, such as slander, arguments, uh, idleness, foolishness, dishonesty, broken promises, false promises, wrong dealings. All right. You say, Pastor, I'll be there next Saturday, and I'm going to help, and I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. And then you don't disappear for a month. That's a broken promise. You'll be judged by that. All right. Personal characteristics, such as uh, lost and neglected opportunities, wasted talents. All right, you're a singer. God told you to sing in the choir. You say, no, I'd rather sing karaoke at the bar. All right, that's a lost opportunity. All right, God's going to judge you for that. God gave you that beautiful voice. You should be singing unto him. All right. Loose living, lack of spirituality, like spiritual traits such, such as disobedience, rejection, failure to cooperate, failure to yield to the Holy Spirit, your spiritual attitude will all be judged by God. All right. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, did you choke him with cigars and cigarettes? Did you drown him in booze? The music, the TV, the entertainment. All right. Do you think the Holy Spirit of God enjoyed those things that you did to your body? You'll be judged by them. Were you a carnal Christian or were you a Christian Christian? Every word that you spoke will be judged. Jesus said in Matthew 12, I said unto every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. All right, we're going to be judged. All right? And what happens is that the, the bad things that we did, that the things that weren't worthy of being a Christian, uh, that'll be a loss of reward. All right, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, every man's work shall be made manifest. Everything that we did will be made known unto God. All right, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if every man, any man's work abide, he built on thereof, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. You say, yeah, you're reading kind of, kind of gibberish. What does that mean? All the things that you've done in, in, in your life as a Christian will be set before the Lord. He's going to set a fire upon it. The bad things are going to burn up. The good things are going to stay. And you have been judged. And then you're going to get some rewards. All right? So the, the tough part is just dealing with your life as a Christian and giving an account. But after that comes the rewards. Those rewards are called believer's crowns. And I've taught this before kind of time and time. And again, I want to remind this to you that as a Christian... Yeah, we get a little spiritual spanking from the Lord for the things that we didn't do for him, but we also get rewarded for the things that we do do. All right, there's five crowns that a believer can obtain at the judgment seat of Christ. The first one is the incorruptible crown. All right, the incorruptible crown, what does incorruptible mean incorruptible? All right, holy living. You kept your body right for the Lord. You did not let it corrupt. You lived a holy life before the Lord, you're going to get the incorruptible crown. That's found in 1 Corinthians 9. Then you have the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2. That's the soul winner's crown. You're winning souls for the Lord. You invite people to church. All right? You're out there evangelizing. You get the crown of rejoicing. You get the crown of life. 
The crown of life is given to those that have died in the service of the Lord. We call that a martyr. For those that endure trials, tribulations, severe suffering, even unto death. All right, over in Iran, in, uh, in North Korea, Vietnam, and even China, Christians get persecuted. In America, we get our feelings hurt, okay? Over there, they kill you, they drown you, they burn you alive, all right? They kill you, they put you in prison, all for preaching Jesus Christ. And should you endure that, you get, you get the crown of life. You get the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness who, who just anxiously love and just wait for the Lord to come back. Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, Lord, come today. Come. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. You get that crown. You just say, no, Lord, I'm not ready. I want to live another 50 years. I want to see how my kids turn out. I want to see how life turns out. I want to see how my 401k does. I want to see what my retirement, I want to see who the next president's going to be. All right, if you don't care if the Lord comes back, you're not going to get that crown. But if you just anxiously wait for him to return, you got a crown of righteousness. All right, the fifth crown is the crown of, of glory. This is called the pastor's crown or minister's crown. These are people that have faithfully uh, led the flock. This can include Sunday school teachers, missionaries, all that teach of the word of God. All right? And in one day, we get to stand before the Lord. You might get one crown. You might get two crowns. You might get three crowns. You might get four crowns. You might get five crowns. I mean, woohoo, you got so many crowns. And the Bible says, we hold them for a brief moment. And then we give the crowns back to the Lord. And we say, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. All right? Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 says, And the four and twenty elders fall down before that sat him on the throne and worshipped him, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. So we get to hold the crown for just a brief moment. All right? So that was kind of a big thing, saying, Oh boy, pass the judgment seat of Christ, we get judged, we get the crown of life. What else are we doing in heaven? Well, also, we're getting married in heaven. All right? Just like Roger and Carolina are getting married. You know, next month, we too are getting married. What is another name for the church? We are called the bride, the bride of what? Of who? Right. We're the bride of Christ. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arraigned in fine linen, clean and white. And the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This is where Jesus will marry, spiritually marry, the bride of Christ, which is us, the church. Okay? And then after we get married, we're going to have an excellent meal with the Lord. And this is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 9 says, And he said unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. For he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. First we get judged, then we get married, then we have a nice meal. We're all in heaven, we're with the Lord, okay? And we're, we're like kind of on a little honeymoon in heaven, all right? And what happens? Then the Lord Looking back at down, well, let me ask you a question. While we're all enjoying all of this, we get raptured, we're in heaven, we get judged, we get married, we're having a meal. What's happening to the world? <laughs> the great tribulation. We get raptured, Satan moves in, the, the world becomes an economic mess, a nation against nation, hatred, murder, devil moves in, a lot of bad happening. All right? Revelation chapter 19 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he just judged and made war. His eyes were a flame as fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him in white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So what's that? Who's the armies? That's us. The Lord says, listen, we got to go down. We got to go bail out the few believers that are saved. We got to take care of the devil. We're, this is called the Lord's second coming. All right? This is called the Lord's second coming. And we get in on the thing. 
we get judged, we get married, we have a dinner, we have a little honeymoon. The Lord says, all right, saddle up. We're going down. we got to go defeat the devil. That's the second coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 says, To the end he may establish your hearts unflammable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We're all his saints. And in the end, the great tribulation, the world's in a mess. The, world's, the world is just a total mess. And the second coming, the Lord returns where he defeats the old unholy trinity of, this, of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and their armies at the Battle of Armageddon. All right? So that's kind of like a quick review. Now here's another question about heaven. What's heaven like? What is heaven like? Well, a few things. We're going to be living in houses. All right? The Lord said he's prepared a mansion for you in heaven. He said in John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. All right? Every time there's a believer, Jesus says, Hey, angels, we got to go build another house. Another, another So-and-so got saved. we got to go build another mansion. Heaven is a beautiful place. All right? Revelation chapter 1 gives a very uh, pretty descriptive uh, picture here of heaven. And the building of the wall was it of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city was garnished with all manner of precious stones, jasper, sapphire, uh, caledony, emerald, sarnix, sardius, uh, crystal, the uh, beryl, topaz. Uh, I hadn't even heard of these, some of these jewels. Oh boy, it's travels past uh, the 11 jasper, the 12th amistad. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold. I mean, we're walking down heaven. We're, we're walking on the street. Whoa, look at this gold. I mean, since we don't have to, you know, buy stuff, you know, we've got to go to Walmart and have it. We're not going to go there and try to, you know, dig the gold out. <laughs> we don't need to because God's going to provide everything for us. The, the gates were as pure as gold. Actually, the gates were pure gold. That's, that's even better. There'll be no darkness in heaven. Why? Because God's glory will shine up and light heaven forever. Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no light there, no candle, uh, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's another thing. Heaven's forever. I don't think we're going to get tired of it. I mean, would you rather go to hell forever and ever? Would you rather stay in heaven forever? There'll be no more sadness, no more sickness, no more pain, and no more death in heaven. Revelation 21, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. We carry a lot of memories in our life, a lot of them good, some of them sad, but we're not going to remember the sad things, we're not going to remember the bad things. Uh, if you've got aches and pain, you know, if you got a bad back, you're going to have a good back in heaven. If you got one leg, now you're going to have two legs in heaven. If you got bad ears, you're going to be able to hear in heaven. If you're blind, you're going to be able to see in heaven. Everything's going to be healed. Everything's going to be right. It's going to be perfect. Perfecto in Spanish lingo. Perfect. <sighs> I'm going to get a breath. I'm, I'm preaching myself out here. <laughs> and we'll get to be with Jesus in heaven. Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Isn't that interesting? We shall see his face. Job said, way back in Job, I will see him for myself and not another. John said, I'm going to see him also. And in Revelation, we're going to get to see him. And his name shall be in their foreheads. Isn't that interesting? What was the devil trying to do during the tribulation? Get everybody to take his mark on the hand or the forehead, and what happens? We get, we get the forehead thing with Jesus. Amen. All right? And for the first time since Adam and Eve, we'll actually get to eat from the, true, from the tree of life, which is in heaven. All right, Revelation 2, verse 7, 7 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat the tree of life, 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Isn't that interesting? But in this time, we can eat the fruit and not have to worry about sinning. God's going to allow us to eat from the tree. And we're going to drink God's pure water in heaven. Revelation 22, 1, and he showed me a pure river of white, of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. No Montezuma's revenge in heaven. We're just going to scoop on up. It'll be the best tasting water you'll ever taste. It'll be the Lord's water. There'll be no more hunger because God will provide for us. There'll be no more violence, no more hate, no more racism, no more complaining, no more negative attitudes. Why? Because God's not part of that. God is love. There'll be no more sleepless nights. There'll be no more taxes, no more easy pass, <laughs> no more traffic, no more Southern State Parkway. Ah. There'll be no fear in heaven because God is our peace. There'll be no more crime in heaven because God is our protector. And we'll get to worship God forever in heaven. <clears throat> Nehemiah 9.6 says, Thou, even thou art Lord alone, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all the hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that are therein, and thou preserveth them all, and the host of heaven worship thee. Say, what do we do in heaven? We worship God. We're going to be walking around. Oh, there's God. Whoa. Hey, I'm in heaven. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Drink some of that holy water. Holy Spirit, Jesus, angels, fellow believers. I got a mansion. Doesn't heaven sound like a pretty good place? I'm not doing a good job describing it, but the Bible does. And I'm just telling you, heaven is a much better place. It's a perfect place as compared to hell. All right? You say, all right, Pastor. You're trying to sell me a timeshare? Are you trying to sell me some real estate? Wait, that sounds too good to be true. Let me tell you something. I don't got to sell nothing. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I have to say, boy, you got to quote a lot of verses today. That's right. I want the Bible to describe what, what heaven is. All right? And you say, Pastor, how do I get to heaven? All right? If you're a Christian, your eternal home is heaven. You don't have to worry about that. All right? But if you're not a born-again Christian today, I want to tell you now how you can get to heaven. It's just having simple faith. All right, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, whoso, that's, that's you, that's me, that's everybody, whoso believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting little faith. All right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Our faith kicks in God's grace. God's grace saves us. We cannot save ourselves. All we can do is put some childlike faith and say, you know what, God? I believe in you now. I believe in what the preacher just said. I believe in John 3, 16. I want to go to heaven. I put my trust and faith in you. And God says, what? Faith. Grace. God's love. Eternal life. Heaven. Woo, I get the Holy Spirit tinglys all over. That's how you should feel. My question is, and we're going to close here, how many people die each year? About 53, 54, 55 million people die each year. How many people die without Jesus? How many funerals have we been to or you've been to this year? We buried a few people this year. How many people uh, die without hearing about hell or hearing about heaven? When you go to heaven, after you die, or the Lord calls you, probably the first words you'll hear from the Lord is, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Heaven's the place I want to be. Amen? you come on up and pray and then choir will bless us with his benediction and uh, then we're going to uh, be dismissed and uh, we're not going to heaven we're going to old <laughs> Hank's house for a barbecue how's that sound alright we're going to have some baptism today <laughs>